Hello and welcome. Today is August 16th, 2020. Um, I'm Watson and I'm sitting here with my friend Ryan and uh, this is going to be our first installment of our new podcast series that we are tentatively calling the never-ending conversation, right? Um, Indeed. Uh, we are sitting in Thailand, and uh, it's hot. Uh, but what we want to talk about today uh, is, does religion, or excuse me, does God need religion? That's our topic. And uh, I guess... To start out, um, I question the uh, arguments that you may have heard people raise throughout the years that, uh, you know, ma mainly coming from atheists, that, you know, God doesn't uh, exist, it's all just like part of the power structure that religious authorities like set up and really built up over the, the centuries yeah and, and that you should just, and that since there's a corruption there they like you know point to the corruption in the power structure and then want to say and then want to discount the possible the logical possibility of the existence of God out of hand and when, when they really haven't even begun to scratch the surface of like whether he exists or not. Yeah, because it's, a, because it's a separable uh, proposition, in other words, like it's entirely separable, the proposition that God exists and the proposition that Christianity is 100% true or even 50% true or some X religion is Y% percent true or, or whatever. And I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of the atheists will argue that it's a sort of control scheme, right? Mm -hmm. It's that hierarchy of trying to control the population by giving them a sort of target that they have to strive to uh, please, mm -hmm. right? It's not necessarily that uh, there is this God that's always watching over you. Uh, uh, it's more like a or law and order type of a thing, like mm -hmm. don't do wrong because there's this magical man in the sky who's going to strike you with a lightning bolt if you... <laughs> yeah, and especially when it comes to specific like rules, if you look into like, Judaism, where they're not allowed to eat certain types of animals like pork mm -hmm. due to um, them believing that because it doesn't chew their cud, right. they're not able to consume that animal. And whereas that may have been something, you know, pigs are generally a fairly um, high transmission rate for disease to humans. Yeah. A uh, so that could have been something that a religious leader would have observed and noticed people getting sick due to, and that could have been a rule that they put in to, you know, kind of control the population and make mm -hmm. sure that they have some safety checks to be like, okay, we notice that people die when you eat pigs, so we can't right. eat pigs. A lot of them are practical, you know, even going back to uh, what the Ten Commandments were based on, which was the Code of Hammurabi. Babylonian Empire, I think, and uh, yeah, you know, it's just like practical rules, don't do this, don't do that, but over time, you know, and with the official religion of the empire, or whatever, the, wherever they are in history, it's like, it just becomes ven uh, no, uh, venerated, like, mm -hmm. over time, to where it goes from just, you know, this is like a set of rules of behavior to being something yeah. that incorporates itself into the do's and don'ts yeah exactly in an eternal sense because <laughs> they get that <laughs> sort of ideology that's based in some founding right like grounded founding of mm -hmm. we notice that this is something that we need to change we need to uh you know adhere curb, to. curb this uh tendency and and mm -hmm. people in general like don't kill yeah, so People for no reason the like, easiest thing would be <laughs> to have something that can observe you at all times which would be the God um, figure. Yeah. And so people would have that notion of, I need to remain on the path of good um, and follow these rules that the religious leaders have set out right. to be able to obtain that heavenly body 
and be able to, mm-hmm. you know, be back in the arms of our, our you know, father figure, um, right. which is God in most of the religions, right? Mm-hmm. So when you sort of take a step back, though, right, like you're saying, does the actual figure of God require these religions to yeah. be something as an actual figure? Because like you were just saying, then it's like, oh, well, don't do such and such because there's a, you know, a magical unicorn in the sky that's like watching everything mm-hmm. that you do. Or rather, it's just in a, in a more general sense that like, uh, yeah, he's there. But so, then, but the question, is he... Is he there is because he there, we believe in him? Or is be, he there and we are just consciously observing? Or, or rather, to, to be more specific, like, did you just invent God as a, you know, to give a reason why you shouldn't break a code of Hammurabi or something, or does it trace back, can we, can we trace back the uh, origin of God prior to the birth of, like, written religion, and that links into written language, because, you know, mm-hmm. language is only, like, 5,000 years old, and you get, you know, the yeah. first religion is essentially within like a hundred or two hundred years from what I was able to pilfer out of the internet was that oh okay like you know about a hundred or two hundred years after like the birth of cuneiform or whatever that they uh you know already had full form or were forming like yeah the early mystery religions and, and stuff so that tells you that tells us that uh there was an oral tradition that preceded. Yeah, and, and most so, civilizations had an oral tradition of and some oral, sort of religion. Yeah, but an oral tradition is going to be vastly different from any sort of organized religion because once you get start writing stuff down, you have, you know, reasons to have rules and excludings one group or another, or you don't believe the right thing, you can't be in our group, mm-hmm. we're the chosen ones, you're not. <laughs> and, yeah. and so we will go to holy war with you, and <laughs> it's justified, but uh, in their, everybody self-justifies their own moral ra- rightness. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, why I think when you look at like the atheist movement, mm-hmm. a lot of the people are observing sort of the corruption within the archetypal structure of these religious movements mm-hmm. right like you look at the like we were just saying the crusades right that's that is mm-hmm. a very sort of so yeah it's like you have to think that you're right before you engage in things that there or at least like they have to find a way to justify going to war and that was always the way that like it was our god best is the one. moved over you know like we have the divine like, we have the agreement. <laughs> yeah, it's ours. Yeah, we are the <laughs> sole holders. I mean, it was like that in China too. You know, it's like Middle East, but yeah. Well, that's, when they built, they yeah, when they built always, the Chinese Empire, and it's been one of the bigger, or at least it is the largest reason why people had gone to war in the previous sense. Mm-hmm. Right? It was the divine conquering will that people would go out and be like, "We are conquering this civilization." That of barbarians or pagans right. or whatever they wanted to call them mm-hmm. and they believed that by bringing their religion they were civilizing these people yep. bringing them into a higher state of awareness right right and that you know that's where it comes in like is that um are they bringing in a different interpretation of the same thing that those people already believed mm-hmm. and i think yeah they were bringing in a a different interpretation because if you look at it most of the religions are usually trying to describe very similar things just maybe from right. different p- viewpoints right right somebody's looking at it from the bottom somebody's looking at something from the side mm-hmm. right and they're both describing the square but you know one sees it as just a flat 2d square and somebody sees it as, as a triangle yeah right because they're viewing it right at that <laughs> at the right angle apex of the, the square right uh-huh. and so then you get these wars started over uh, people disputing oh well your god says this and 
yeah, so when you end up looking at a lot of these religions, they're starting wars over our God is the right God. And they usually have the founded proof of, you know, when they go to the war, if they win the war, then they feel justified because, well, look, our God backed us more than your God. So we clearly have right. the backing of the one true God. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. It ends up like justifying it after the fact. It's like if you win, you can be like, oh, look, people of our country, like our God is with us. Now come sacrifice your virgins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> something. But uh, yeah, so it seems that we have established, or it is easy to establish, that religion needs God. That's the converse of our uh, general topic of discussion. So, yeah, we haven't really seen yet whether God needs religion, but, you know, if you take God out of the equation of religion, I mean, what do you really have? But, you know... A club? Mm -hmm. It's just a yeah, bunch like of people. Maybe like Confucianism or something. <laughs> yeah, but even I find Confucianism, you know, it it has some rooting in a, a, di a, a divine is it? intervention, right? There's some mm -hmm. being that you, or at least some, maybe let's not say being. Or they just maybe like worship the precepts. So like they worship maybe the principles could be eternal or something. Maybe. Yeah. But yeah. So, so again, to me, it's a, for quite some time, it's been important to separate God from religion before you can have a philosophical conversation with, you know, a, a captive audience, people listening and uh, having gone through the prereqs of where I'm kind of thinking about things. So, uh, so does God need religion? The argument that really strikes me hard that the answer to that question is no is the following so you think about nature and you think about cavemen and we're just going to imagine going back in time to France around 30,000 years ago and uh, your uncle Og has just passed away and the village is there and they're like burying and putting stones on top of him and uh, doing their ceremony or whatever because archaeologically speaking it's known that ritualistic burial may in Europe go back even as far as 50 to 100,000 years. I mean the Cro-Magnon Cro Cro had uh, a larger brain cavity than modern day Homo sapiens sapiens modern day man and so did uh, Neanderthal. They both had larger brains and the idea is just this, that, uh, you know, we, even in the modern age, we like to pretend that, you know, death is not inevitable. You know, we just live our lives as if we're going to live on forever. A lot of times it's just easy to forget that if you're in great health and you're in your prime, you, you, you don't need to think about dying. I mean, uh, but, but uh, it eventually comes back to you, to, to all of us, and no matter what age we're living in. And... Uh, specifically, uh, back in the day, no hospitals and death was everywhere. People probably had short, gruesome, uh, cruel life. Life was tough, uh, let's just say. And when people died, inevitably, and the contemplating mind of man was sitting there thinking about death and about mortality, as soon as you start generalizing, hypothesizing, you know, what humans do, like, you know, if they were anatomically modern, then we have to assume that they could have abstract thoughts. And at the moment, as soon as you have like free thinking humans having abstract thoughts about death, you can, it's extremely easy to just extrapolate to uh, an immortal being from all this like mortality around us. Uncle Og died. Oh, I'm going to die one day. I've already broke my leg and like I hobble. I have to rely on my brother to like get the food and everything. And you just, oh. I wish I didn't have to die. I wish I didn't have to die. And from there, what if there is a being that never dies? Or at least, what would it be like, before that, what would it be like to not ever die? And then maybe what if there's a being that, that does have that characteristic? And what would that being be like? And uh, yeah. yeah. And when you say that. And, and also when you question like where 
the, where everything comes from, you know, because you see birth and it's like, oh, this child came from the mother. Mm -hmm. But then you look at the earth and the world in general and the caveman mind is like, oh, where did the earth come from? And maybe there was like some connecting of the dots between their already presupposed yeah, idea. And like, death was par fairly prominent back then, but I, mm -hmm. I think one of the, like you're saying with the abstract thought, one of the bigger things that I think would have been more predominant for any living being with conscious abilities uh, would be just even to look up in this night sky and go, wow, where did this? Yeah, the this? Orig basically the origin question was kind of... Yeah, they and that, that would be more prominent than the death, right? You look up and you see all these, these lights in the sky mm -hmm. and you wonder where the sun went and now there's this big white orb instead of a yeah. bright orange one mm -hmm. and it really starts to make you start thinking about, okay, well, what is all that stuff, right? And I think that's where like the, a lot of origins of religion come from, right? Like it really started from the as astrology, right? Okay. People, people defining, oh, look at this constellation and they make stories out of them to be able yeah. to tell. Yeah, because every them. night there's this big mystery. Mm -hmm. It's essentially like forcing cosmology, you know, onto <laughs> primitive minds, like, and it's one thing that we don't see very often anymore, living in our modern civilizations, right? We always have lights on. Yeah. Um, it's, it's even, you know, especially here in Thailand, right? Mm -hmm. we, with That's the amount of dust in the atmosphere, yeah. it being such a dry country, yep. you can see maybe like 15 to 20 stars out of the billions in the night sky. Oh, yeah. It's very difficult. It's remarkably dusty around here. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, maybe before... There would, there would be areas that you wouldn't be able to really see the night sky mm -hmm. as prominently as you can. But, you know, where, well, when I go back home and look up in the night sky, it's insane. Like, gotcha. you see the whole Milky Way just spread right out, right? It's, uh -huh. it's gorgeous. And it really does start to get you thinking of, you know, just, wow, yeah. where, well, where are we in this, this I'm, universe? I'm not sure if it's evident that, like, one came one of those like came before the other but i will at least say that like they're both and others like other pathways of thought would be there in the mix way early on uh, a possible definition of human is like being able to comprehend the idea of god mm -hmm. exactly and so when they start to think about these you know grander ideas of existence by mortality or yeah origin like yeah and they're not doing it in anything that we would term as a religion yeah but um, i think oh you can extrapolate perfection from making mistakes too because if you like regret having made a mistake and then you just generalize again like the what if like, what if i'd never made a mistake oh boop i would be perfect like in a sense of like mistakes you never made mistakes you'd have to be perfect yeah. and nobody that we know of is perfect nope. it becomes it becomes just this idea in the mind but but to me i call it the mental pregnancy the mental pregnancy is when the mind whenever it was you know that the idea of god first entered the mind of man because uh yeah from there it gestates but you have to have the idea of God there before you can conglomerate the, the power structure of, of you know, pay, tithe and mm -hmm. whip yourself with the, the, you know, whatever it's called, flogging or self flagellation. The, uh, yeah, yeah punishing yourself for, mm -hmm. for saying, yeah, like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so. so, yeah, so it seems like that we're getting to the point of, um, you know, religion isn't really necessary to have a God figure or this idea of God. It would mm -hmm. be something that right. came it more... demonstrated that there are logical avenues. We haven't listed them all and there's probably no way to definitively know that we did, so... Exactly. And so I see the religious structures of today's society, you know, they may have, and I, I believe that they do have some very... Um, tangible pieces of information relating to what God is and a proper way to organize civilization and oneself as mm -hmm. well. Um, 
especially within Buddhism, right? That's a very structural uh, path to be able to find enlightenment and happiness within your own life, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least better for your next life if you believe in reincarnation. Right. And so I don't really necessarily think that uh, religion is strictly required to have a God figure, um, but the religions of today are strictly there trying to organize and mm -hmm. um, put people in the right path. But maybe it's gotten to a point where now, especially with like the wars and everything fought over people with different religions, it's getting to a point of detriment. Yeah. Right? People are arguing over whose God's right, whose God's existing, whose, yeah. whose is the true God. And even though they're all grasping at the same God, mm -hmm. right? I like kind of the, just being a personal discovery, you know, you're just discovering God yourself. Yeah. And that's a very... Uh, and create, creating your own religion, you know, not following anybody else, just following your own lines of, of thought, what makes most sense to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what but I you think can't is have missing. an idea about something that may or may not exist until you first propose the existence of it. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, this thing might exist, and now we have all these ideas about it, and we still don't know if it exists or not. Yeah, and that's again, where I find like a lot of people that are stuck in the strict, you know, there is no God, mm -hmm. as I was. Once I gave her an opportunity to say, okay, if there is a God, how, like, and start thinking about if there is a God, right? That's the first step, mm -hmm. right? As soon as you lock yourself in the, the ideology of there's no God, I'm not even going to entertain the idea then that's your mind, I think, sort of locks yourself from ever experiencing those those keys, right? Mm -hmm. You can't ever pick up that key and unlock the door because that key's already locked behind another door that's just open by saying, maybe there is a God. And if there is a God, yeah. then this, 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 right? How would it exist? What would be exactly sort of And entity? how would it exist indeed? <laughs> Right. And for that, just in general, we think to, or we look to uh, unification. We consider ourselves unificationists in the sense that, like, we believe that anything that exists is unified in some integrated fashion where everything is interrelated. Exactly. Cause including, yeah. including God, you know, anything that exists could have an eternal existence, but it's going to have some sort of logico-causal, spatio-temporal yeah. uh, interplay with the rest of everything that's going on. Exactly. And I feel just like that, you know, it's hard to bring proof, right? You'll never, right. You'll never have something like, you know, an apple dropping to prove gravity and mm -hmm. uh, an experiment of the slit. Like it's the sort slit. of like it it proves itself potentially at the very moment that it uh, is experienced. Exactly. It is an very, experience, right? Yeah, you, it's you a manifestation. <laughs> yeah, it's something you experience, not something that you can videotape and put on a, right. or write down right, on a right. piece of paper, yeah. right? Proof and it's, experience. Because everybody's experience is going to be different to get to that same result of, you know, we have some, some entity and I like to think of it more of like an energy that mm -hmm. just resonates throughout the entirety of the universe. And it's not something that we can design a sensor to pick up. Yeah. Right. You know, we've got pretty good sensors to be able to pick up everything from gamma rays right down to your, you know, radio and infrared rays and all those large spectrums of light, um, light sensing yeah. uh, technologies. Right. But you know, human innovation is fairly limited, right? Mm -hmm. We're limited by the resources that are on this planet to be able to make something to sense right. something of such grandeur design. And yeah. maybe we can think about it, but I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we can tangibly be like, and this is it right here. Yeah. This little blip mm -hmm. on this sensor proves that that is God, right? right? We'll never get to that point. Yeah, at least not take, not anytime soon. It could take forever, <laughs> or a very long time. Well, but, uh, if we keep fighting, <laughs> I think that uh, our challenge for the listener is: uh, if you're a like atheist, we challenge you to think differently and to just simply realize that logically, 
God doesn't necessarily have to be tied to religion. And uh, from there, we welcome comments and, uh, dis and discussion. Yeah, so thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to try and do this hopefully weekly, get some, you know, maybe 20 to 30 minutes out a week mm -hmm. just talking about topics like this. Um, Hell yeah. Please join us for the discussion and join us next time. Yeah, join us next time and we welcome to hear your opinions in the comments down below. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks a lot.